If there was a single person who knew what it meant to add something to the flow, that person is Steve Jobs. One of the best books I've ever read, this biography by, by Walter Isaacson, yes, it's full of insightful business lessons and, and poignant takeaways, for sure. It's also hilarious. It's full of fights and jokes and yelling and sex and drugs and it's hysterical. I was laughing my ass off reading this book. This is the longest book I've read since I was an angsty teen reading about horny <clears throat> vampires. But, uh, but for real, this book is special. Personally and professionally, Steve Jobs might have had the most extraordinary life ever. And I would say, thanks to Isaacson's work, I would now cite him as my greatest role model. So the very first chapter, the very first chapter of this book reads like an episode of The Jerry Springer Show. It's unbelievable. You got paternity tests that say, Steve Jobs, you are conclusively the father. Steve Jobs is like, mm -mm, that is not my baby. Families being torn apart, siblings separated at birth who meet their Muslim Syrian dad in a diner 40 years later, it's chaos. What you need to know is Steve Jobs is given up for adoption by his biological parents. When Jobs is like six, he confronts his adoptive parents. They sat him down, he recalls, and said very slowly, we specifically picked you out. These concepts, abandonment, being chosen, feeling special, molded Steve Jobs for the rest of his life. Fast forward to high school. By senior year, Jobs is dropping acid. Let me say that again. By senior year, Steve Jobs was dropping acid. Honestly, same. You know, who wasn't? Later at college, a day comes when Jobs needs some cash. So he decides to sell his typewriter. So he walks into the room of the kid who offered to buy it, only to find that this guy and his girlfriend are having sex. So Jobs starts to leave and the kid says, no, take a seat while we finish. Jobs recalls, I thought, whoa, this is kind of far out. So this guy who likes to bang in public, this guy's name is Friedland. Now get this, Friedland transferred to Reed where Jobs was attending after being arrested at his previous school for possession of 24,000 tablets of LSD worth $125,000. He gets sentenced to two years at a federal prison, gets paroled, transfers to Reed, runs for student body president, and wins. So naturally, Steve Jobs is like, I'm a hang with this guy. They become close, they're getting really into enlightenment and spirituality, even after Jobs drops out of school. Because the dean was so impressed with Jobs' inquisitive mind, he's like, all right, keep going to class, don't worry about tuition, sweet. So he takes this uh, calligraphy class where he becomes enamored with typography. It was beautiful, historical, artistically subtle in a way that science can't capture. This is an early instance of Jobs placing himself at the intersection of the arts and technology. Later, in all of his products, he would combine tech with great design, elegance, and especially romance. In 1976, at the first annual Personal Computer Festival, yes, Personal Computer Festival, it's the saddest sounding thing I've ever heard of. The Apple One, you know the story, Jobs, Wozniak, Parents Garage, it does not impress. They look scruffy, so does the product. But Jobs realizes, okay, the Apple II needs to be a complete package, okay, for the mass market. So to realize this fully integrated Apple II, they need money. So they start looking for investors and they get connected with this guy, Mike, Mike Marcula. So Marcula writes his Apple marketing philosophy on a one page paper that stresses three points. The third of which is impute. People do judge a book by its cover. He writes, we may have the best product, the highest quality, the most useful software. If we present these in a slipshod manner, they will be perceived as slipshod. If we present them in a creative professional manner, they will impute the desired qualities and reaction. Jobs would remember this for the rest of his life, obsessing over marketing, image, and packaging. When you open an iPod, iPhone package, we want that tactile experience to set the tone for how you view the product. Mike taught me that. So as Apple is getting its feet off the ground, Xerox is also developing a small personal computer, developing user-friendly graphics that would replace all the command lines and prompts that made computers at this time really intimidating. So one of the Apple employees, this guy Raskin, is like, look, everybody, Jobs, go check it out. The only problem is, Jobs found this guy Raskin insufferable, or to use Steve Jobs' own words, a shithead who sucks. Steve Jobs, you see, had this charming habit of categorizing everyone he worked with as either gods or shitheads, either the best or total shithead asshole morons. Eventually, Jobs was like, all right, I'll peep what Xerox is up to. He knows it's the future. He loves it. And he can tell that Xerox is not taking full advantage. So listen, listen, listen to what Steve Jobs 
Tells, one of the head designers at Xerox, everything you've ever done in your life is shit. So why don't you come work for me? Let, let's recap. When Mike joined Wozniak and Jobs and turned their dumpy little partnership into Apple Computer Company in 1977, they valued their partnership, their company, at like $5,000. Yes, $5,000. Four years later, they take it public when it would be valued at $1.79 billion, turning 300 people millionaires in the process. Steve Jobs, at age 25, was worth $256 million. Although he considered himself like an anti-materialistic hippie of certain finely crafted products, Steve Jobs was definitely fond. Porsche cars and BMW motorcycles, brawn appliances and banging offs and audio equipment. All of these in common reinforced his dedication to perfectionism and his impatience with those who made compromises in order to get products out on time and on budget. At this time, there was another company who had made the first truly portable personal computer, but it kind of sucked. It had a small screen and a uh, not that much memory. Uh, their CEO had famously said, adequacy is sufficient. All else is superfluous. Steve Jobs <laughs> found this morally appalling. Yelling, yelling as he walked around the Apple halls, this guy just doesn't get it. He's not making art, he's making shit. Because Jobs was so particular about design, about perfectionism, he had a hard time furnishing his own house. It was pretty much empty. So when he marries this woman, Powell, and they buy a house in Palo Alto and need to start buying furniture, Powell recalls, we spoke about furniture in theory for eight years. We spent a lot of time asking ourselves, what is the purpose of a sofa? What is the eight year furniture theory? It sounds insane, but I kind of love it. You know, like I go to some of my friends, little apartments, their little houses, not to sound rude, it does kind of beg the question, what was the theory behind this decorating? Another great scene, if you're wondering what the what home life was like at the Jobs residence. The family eventually needs a new washing machine. So Jobs does some research and he finds out that European washers are more efficient, they're not as rough on your clothes, but they take twice as long as North American washers. Jobs says, we spent a lot of time talking about design, but also about the values of our family. Did we value more getting the wash done in an hour? or about our clothes lasting longer. We spent about two weeks discussing this every night at the dinner table. They eventually settle on a mealy washer and dryer made in Germany. I got more thrill out of those than any other piece of high tech in years, Jobs said. Okay, if the mealy advertising team is not using this exact story verbatim in their marketing, to quote Steve Jobs, what is German for, there's some shitheads who suck. All right, in 1985, some drama goes down. Jobs gets forced out of Apple. He goes for like 12 years. He's doing other stuff. At the time, Apple under the CEO, Emilio, who's like not good with design. He doesn't appreciate it. The product development process goes back to being engineer driven, meaning the engineers, they're like, all right, here's the processor. Here's the guts. Here's the hard drive. The designers, the creative people who know what users want, they just have to put it in some box, which results in awful products. Johnny Ive, who was head of the Apple design team at this time, said there wasn't this sense that we were we were putting care into the product because we were just trying to maximize the money we made. He was gonna quit, and then the following year, the very following year, Steve Jobs comes back, they form this partnership, they immediately get each other this kind of inside-out perfectionism, and the process goes back to being design-driven, not engineering-driven. So when Ive and Jobs start designing the iMac G3, they go to a jelly bean factory to study how to make translucent colors look enticing. These translucent cases cost 60 bucks per unit, which is three times more than a standard computer case. At other companies, this kind of decision, right, would have demanded presentations, you know, PowerPoints, analysis, we need to make sure that the, that the extra case justifies the price of the... Pfft. Steve Jobs said, I don't want none of that. This is, this is sweet. Do you understand what we're talking about here? Bill Gates, would never be caught, would never be in a jelly bean factory in the first place. You know, one of my professors once said, creativity, he had heard, had been defined as unexpected connections between unrelated ideas. That is jelly beans and computers. That is Apple, that is Steve Jobs. The reason that Apple resonates with people is that there's a deep current of humanity in our innovation. Perfect example. 
the first couple Apple stores are rolling out. In hindsight, Steve Jobs is like, ah, the, the bleached hardwood floors, I'm not feeling it. He's thinking about this stone that he had seen on the sidewalks of Florence. So obviously, all of his colleagues are like, look, we can fake it with concrete, the same texture, the same color. It's gonna be 10 times cheaper, 10 times cheaper. Steve Jobs, he wants to use this blue stone Pietra Serena from this quarry outside of Florence. Again, go back to Microsoft, go back to Sony. Let's put some concrete down, save some money and call it a day. That is not the Apple way. That is not Steve Jobs approach. When you're at an Apple store and you're standing on the same damn stone that Italian artists were 500 years ago, that is the deep current of artistry that we're talking about here. What drove me? asked Jobs as his cancer numbered his final days. It's about trying to express something in the only way that most of us know how, because we can't write Bob Dylan songs. We try to use the talents we do have to express our deep feelings, to show our appreciation of all the contributions that came before us, and to add something to that flow. That is what has driven me. The personal computer was not Steve Jobs' contribution to mankind. Marrying art and technology in ways that only he dared to do, he contributed unrivaled craftsmanship to the stream of history and flow of human consciousness. You and I and everyone on this planet has a chance to do the same. Now what are we gonna add?